Hello hackers! Welcome to Pwn College. I'm Jan and today we're going to be talking about assembly. Um, this is the first video of the assembly crash course. It's a new module in Pwn College. Uh, I guess anytime you see me in a video it's a new video or new module so I guess that's not saying much but um, we used to have uh, this this very big um, assumption that you know assembly that you know computer architecture etc etc we're trying to get away from that become a uh, kinder gentler uh, more guided pwn college for um, a wider amount of people as part of that i am um, revamping the assembly educational material and as part of that i'm re-recording this course uh, this uh, entire module rather so this original video was recorded back in the early, early days of Pwn College, and actually this video wasn't changed much. So what I'm going to do is let my past self speak for the material. My past self is younger, more enthusiastic, less sleep deprived, and I think will do a great job. So we're going to jump backwards in time to an earlier Pwn College, and then I'll see you at the next video. Ciao. Oh, hello, I'm Jan, and today we're going to be talking about computer architecture fundamentals. You might notice I am in the top right corner as opposed to the normal lower right corner. Uh, that's because I interfere with the slides less that way. Sorry if this confuses you. Um, we'll try to be more consistent, but no promises. Maybe one day I'll be right in the middle. Um, all right, let's talk about computer architecture. The point I want to get across in this lecture, in, in some sense, is that um, all roads lead to the CPU. You might be a Python developer. You might like to write Rust because you're very hip. Um, and everything you write, eventually, no matter what it is, ends up being executed as binary encoded instructions on a CPU. Right, if you're running, writing Rust, you have a compiler that compiles your code, and then that becomes binary code running on the CPU. If you're running Python, you might have an interpreter um, that is a binary program executing on the CPU, performing the things that your code wants to do. You might say, but wait, Jan, I use PyPy, a just-in-time compiler for Python, or I use JavaScript or something along those lines. Then you know, your code isn't interpreted, it is compiled on the fly into binary instructions that end up getting executed on your CPU. Uh, one potential exception to this is languages like CUDA, uh, that where you write um, code that ends up as binary compiled instructions that get executed on a GPU. But a GPU and a CPU for this purpose are basically the same thing. Um, let's drill down into the CPU. Whoa, that's really far down. So, this is basically as deep down into a CPU as is reasonable to drill for a computer scientist, right? These are logic gates. Conceptually speaking, at the center of your CPU are, are many, 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 many logic gates computing furiously to bring you this lecture or whatever else you use your computer for. Um, personally, I think that logic gates is where we should start computer science education. Right now we start on a high level with Python and Java and if statements and for loops. It's all about logic gates, right? So if we started with logic gates and then we built up the concepts, I think it would make for a much more uh, smooth step-by-step -step, uh, computer science education because the concept of a logic gate is very simple. There are, let's say, four types of logic gates, but you can really build uh, quite a lot. Uh, you can build the other logic gates using any three, right? There's the AND gate. You have two inputs to your AND gate. If either of them are true, the output is true. What does true mean? Well, true means different things depending on the physical medium. If you have uh, a computer that runs on electricity internally um, then you have a your inputs 
true or not true is some sort of a voltage uh, threshold, right? So if there's some voltage coming in on both wires, there'll be a voltage coming out for an AND gate. Um, if you have some sort of an optical gate, those exist, it can be light, is light coming in. You could have um, water, you can build an AND gate out of a cup powered by water and gravity, if, or uh, an OR gate out of a cup at least. If you drill a hole in the bottom of the cup, you have two pipes going to the cup. If either pipe has water, there will be water pouring out of that, that cup. Um, so an OR gate, two inputs, one output. Either of the inputs is true, the output is true. Um, you could build these things in uh, video games, and people do. People build whole computers in video games. If you play Dwarf Fortress, uh, you've likely uh, encountered, you know, people talking about computers that they built out of uh, using water as the computing medium, right? So they build uh, logic gates on water and so forth. Uh, in Minecraft, you can use redstone, and 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 there's tons and tons of, of different ways to do it. Um, you have um, XOR gates, where you have two inputs, and if only one of those inputs is true, the output is true. If they're both true, the output is false. If they're both false, the output is false. Um, and then of course you have not gates where if the input is true, your one input, the output is also uh, is false. And if the input is false, the output is true. This is very simple. It's a trivially simple concept. Um, if you've taken discrete mathematics, you've probably created truth tables uh, around this and, and it's just, it, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. And the interesting thing is by combining these gates in clever ways, we can start taking small steps to a computer like this, right? So this slide has a bunch of different um, uh, combinations of gates. Um, there's an adder on this slide where basically if you, you give it two numbers and a carry flag from previous computation and it'll give you a result of the addition and a carry flag. Of course, in this case, the numbers are simple bits, but you can make adders that work on arbitrarily large, um, or are, you know, as long as you have more and more uh, gates on larger and larger inputs. Um, there's a multiplexer there where you can, uh, based on your input, you can select one of the, the signals, uh, one output signal. Um, that, for example, has obvious implications for memory, right? Where if you want to read some memory in a computer you, or, or seek into your Python array, at some point, some decision like this gets made on logic gates, which is pretty exciting, right? Um, speaking of memory, there's also memory um, on this, uh, made out of, of, of logic gates on the slide, right? So you can use a uh, clever combination of logic gates to be able to store, read, and uh, um, store and read memory, uh, single bits of memory right here, right? Um, basically, the uh, combinations and the, the potential is endless, and at some point, some incredibly magical point, we move from just some logic gates that are super simple you can write them out and pay. There's nothing special about them. You can drill a hole in the cup and have an OR gate to a computer, right? There's a, some magical thing to a computer. A computer can, can compute. A logic gate can't really compute. So now we've, we've crossed this magical threshold and then right on the other side of this threshold is where much of this course will operate on the, the binary level um, and, and security issues and implications there. Um, that's the, the part I love about computing, this, this uh, magical boundary where, where computing starts to happen. Um, a modern computer uh, might look something like, like this, right? At a very high level, uh, you have um, your CPU. Uh, it communicates over some sort of a hardware bridge or whatever protocol to, to memory, to your disk, to your network, uh, to your, your, your monitor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So let's focus on, on uh, memory, disk, network, and so forth, um, and drill just a little deeper, right? Your CPU isn't just a monolithic thing. It has uh, uh, parts, uh, like different, different components. Um, it has registers, small bits of memory that it uh, 
can interact with or store small bits of storage not to get confused with the main memory it has a control unit this control unit decides what to execute um decodes instructions um and dispatches um things to to other parts of the cpu and the computer as an arith arithmetic logical unit right um uh, where uh the various computations adding and and so forth happens and there are other parts there's floating point uh processors there's there's all sorts of parts of a computer at a high level uh let's stick with this and add one thing there's uh caching turns out that modern computer architecture is basically a series of caching layers uh, stacked on top of each other, right? So you start out, you can think of the, the biggest, biggest possible one, and it's the internet, right? The internet has insane amounts of storage, storage that you could never hope to, to uh, you know, so much data that you can never hope to acquire it all in one location. And that one location that you have, of course, is a disk where you can put a lot of data, more than could fit into your computer's memory, which is what you know you uh, want just the stuff that you're actively working on to be in. If you're actively playing a game, um, you want as much of that as possible to be in memory rather than swapping in and out of disk because disk access is slow. As we move up, and, and get smaller and smaller in these uh, storage sizes, uh, the trend is we get faster and faster. So accessing network uh, is slow, right? You have to send you know packets across the world. Accessing your disk is much faster, but accessing memory is even faster than that. When you read from memory, it goes into a special place in your CPU. That special place is called the cache. You read from that, um, you move it to the cache, and then that is faster than memory, but much, much smaller. And then the CPU pulls from the cache um, to put data into registers. And those are extraordinarily fast, but so small, so expensive that there's, you know, very, depending on the architecture, um, anywhere from like eight to 40 of them. But, you know, and they're anywhere from, you know, two to uh, eight bytes to maybe, 16 bytes sometimes in, in size. Um, so it's, it's you're, you're getting gradually faster and faster, but gradually smaller and smaller. And then um, your CPU actually acts only on your cache and your registers. Everything else gets loaded in and out of it, right? It's a, a very interesting computer architecture. In recent years, it's gotten complicated a little bit more in that our CPUs actually have multiple cores. Um, so if you have a multi-core processor, which uh, basically more or less everybody uh, at this point does, you likely have multiple cores. Each of them has its own cache, its own registers, et cetera, et cetera. And then they share a common cache and then you have memory, disk, network, and so on. Um, where did we get this computer architecture? Well, we got it from these um, three Johns, a physicist, an electrical engineer, and a mathematician created what ended up um, being called, uh, due to a misadventure with a uh, draft, the von Neumann architecture, um, a draft of, of a paper that, that um, John Malkley and, and uh, John Eckert were writing. Um, so the von Neumann architecture is this um, series of uh, shrinking but uh, increasing in uh, speed um, layers where in the end we have something very interesting in that the CPU as it works on its cache and registers and so forth for the most part, doesn't differentiate between data, code, and etc. right? This has implications that we'll explore later uh, in later modules, but I wanted to give you this background to set the stage for the future of this course. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this topic as much as I enjoy it. Uh, one of the nice perks of being a professor is being able to lecture more or less about whatever you want. 
So this was my addition to the course. Um, otherwise, I will see you or you will see me in future videos. Thanks.